Today, stocks take a tumble. Apple, Tesla, Amazon, and Microsoft all down big. Plus, Joe Biden pulls in a record-breaking fundraising haul with 60 days left before the presidential election. And finally, America's oil industry is in trouble. We explain why. I'm Mackenzie Segalos, and this is CNBC After Hours. A really rough day on Wall Street. The Dow dropped more than 800 points, the S&P tanked by about 3.5%, and the Nasdaq, yes, the index with all the tech stocks, dropped by almost 5%. Tech companies have been leading the market higher since late March, helping stocks claw back to pre-COVID-19 levels. But investors hit the sell button today, breaking a 10-day winning streak for the tech sector. Apple shares fell 8%, Amazon fell 4%, Netflix down about 5%, and Microsoft falling by more than 6%. You get the idea. So that's what's going on on Wall Street. Now here's the latest from DC. Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden says that he raised $364.5 million in August, both for his campaign and his joint committees with the Democratic Party. It's a big number. In fact, it's the largest single month fundraising amount in presidential election history. The Biden campaign claims 95% of all donations came from grassroots supporters and that 57% came from online donations. That said, Donald Trump's presidential campaign and its joint committees have outraised Biden since April, around when Biden became the de facto Democratic nominee. We talked with CNBC's Brian Schwartz, who covers money and politics, to break down what it means for the 2020 election. Joe Biden and the Democratic National Committee raised about $364 million in August. And really what that means for Biden and Democrats is that it's going to give them enough resources to compete against Donald Trump and the Republican National Committee after they've amassed a war chest that's helped them over the last few years since at least 2016. And so Biden and the Democrats have had to find a way to compete. And it looks like they're right there with Trump and the Republicans because it comes at a time when you're about 60 days away from facing Trump in the general election, just a few weeks away from a major debate against the president. So this will give him enough resources, at least for the next month or two, uh, to really push the president on air and online. And I think that's gonna be key uh, going forward. The $364 million number is a historic number. Let's just be clear about that right off the bat. Basically, the way we look at it is it's more than what Donald Trump raised in August of 2016, similar time period. It's more than what Hillary Clinton raised in 2016 when she was facing Trump for the Democratic nomination. It's a big number. It's probably the biggest fundraising month that any candidate for president has ever had. That is how big that number is. And that is how important it is to Joe Biden. Uh, but to be clear, Biden and his campaign has said the large amount of this money came from grassroots donors, that he says that the average donation was about $40 over the course of this month. And I think that what's key here is it's going to be fascinating to see who the big money donors are uh, when it is announced. And we should know the next month or two who gave this month, how much, and what people from which part of the business industry uh, are supporting Biden uh, this past month. And we won't know that for a month or so. But that's going to be key as well to see who's getting in his corner in the final 60 days or so of the election. Joe Biden is not going to do a lot of in-person campaigning. You're not going to see this money go toward canvassing or setting up events for in-person events. Most of it is going to go toward, most likely at least, TV and digital ads, um, as well as different digital forms of outreach, however that may be, through uh, email chains and, 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 and whatever means they can, they can connect with voters. But the bottom line is it's not going to be going toward in-person things at all due to the coronavirus pandemic. And now let's get to our sound check. Here's a roundup of the day's biggest action and what the top newsmakers and business leaders had to say on CNBC's airwaves.
Just getting some news uh, out of a pharma briefing uh, from a European pharma group uh, from the Pfizer CEO. They, of course, are in the lead uh, along with Moderna in terms of running phase three clinical trials. Uh, Albert Borla, the CEO, is saying that their phase three trial has now enrolled 23,000 of the 30,000 participants going ahead of schedule. And he reiterated they expect to know if the vaccine works by the end of October. Meanwhile, they are simultaneously ramping up and preparing the application for FDA authorization. So they'll be ready to file as soon as they have that data, guys. Expectations have come down a lot. We are now looking at a moderation in the improvement in, in the labor market. That's not good news for the long term because it leaves, um, if you like, scars in the economy. It increases the cost of long term. The fact that they didn't tell people where their orders were going and how Robinhood was making money um, is a clear violation of SEC rules. It's important for investors to know what's going to happen with their information and their orders. So depending on what you compare it to, it's between 50 and 100% greater range uh, for the same uh, exact size of pack, uh, which is pretty substantial. But even more important in the range, uh, or as important as the range, uh, is the fact that you'll be able to fast charge these batteries. So uh, with our batteries, you'll be able to do a 15 minute fast charge. And that combination has never been done before. So the idea of a, a long range battery uh, that can be charged more rapidly uh, really helps close the gap between electric cars and combustion engine based vehicles. We've learned quite a bit in, uh, since we moved completely remote and we as a company moved um, in March fully remote, a uh, setting that we've never had. And I do agree with what, what is said quite often these days that it does work and, and work as such works remotely. But what we also have seen and we, we got that feedback quite consistently from our employees is that there are certain aspects missing when you work completely remote. So people still really don't want to go to airports. The number of travelers passing through airport checkpoints in the U.S. has fallen 226% from where it was last year. That's according to official data from the TSA. And we're talking about peak travel season, the height of summer, when airlines typically see the most number of people booking flights. But the coronavirus pandemic is helping keep travel demand super low compared to normal. Now, that's bad for the airlines. It's bad for the hotel business. I mean, it's pretty bad for tourism in general. But it's also really, really bad for the oil and gas sector. Less air travel means less gasoline is needed to fuel planes. Not to mention the wild fluctuations in oil prices in the last 12 months including the price of U.S. oil turning negative for the first time in history. The second quarter of 2020 saw 18 bankruptcies of oil and gas producers, the highest quarterly total in four years, according to law firm Haynes & Boone. So just how bad is it for the American oil business? CNBC's Brian Sullivan breaks it all down for us. I think Exxon leaving the Dow kind of single-handedly defines the state of the energy sector. It has never been a smaller percentage of the overall market than it is now, just over 4%. Used to be in the double-digit percentages here. Investors, they don't want to own energy stocks for a couple of reasons. Number one, huge amounts of debt in that industry. Maybe not with the biggest of the players, but a lot of these mid-cap stocks, they have grown on debt. Number two, price of oil has been way too volatile the last 10 years or so. $140, $20, hundred bucks, negative 40. In fact, the last few months has been shockingly stable, but that scared people off. And of course, you've also got what they call ESG investing, environmental social governance. And there's a lot of institutions, big funds with huge amounts of money who simply don't wanna own it or cannot in some cases own these energy stocks because they wanna to go to more climate friendly alternatives. It had been a very tough situation. Energy has been really a net money loser over the last decade. Oil demand is going to remain muted until everybody is commuting again. And I don't just mean by car, I mean by plane, because really the biggest drag on oil demand has been jet fuel. I mean, air travel is still on its best days now, one third 
of what it was a year ago. I, I'm not worried about flying. The problem is there's just nowhere to go. And so I think was, as long as companies keep these do not travel policies, not just don't come into the office, but you know, don't go anywhere, you're gonna see air travel remain muted, which could keep a lid on oil demand. According to Rystad Energy, one of the biggest energy research firms in the world, there's gonna be many, many, many more bankruptcies in the oil and gas space. You know, $40, $45 oil is simply not going to cut it for many of these debt heavy companies. This is gonna be a very difficult time for a lot of people in Texas and North Dakota and parts of New Mexico where you've got the shale revolution going. I mean, Midland, Texas really is the heart, Odessa, the, the Permian region. The job market there lives and dies by the price of oil. What's gonna be very interesting in the next, you know, five to 10 years is that watching perhaps the shift of some of these big quote oil companies into more renewables. Energy companies want to produce energy. If these big companies continue their shift into more renewables, right, be an energy company, not a quote oil and gas company, and if they start to and investors reward them, that will likely speed up the move for the other companies. The demand for power, just power, maybe not gas, but power is only going to go up. Okay, time for today's numbers round. We'll kick it off with one. Facebook will now ban new political ads for one week in the lead up to election day this November. The company will also remove posts that try to suppress or discourage voting. The announcement came from Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg earlier today. It's happening as part of a series of steps to address concerns about how Facebook could be used to manipulate the election. The social media giant remains under intense scrutiny for allowing the spread of fake news and hate speech. All of this is fallout from Russia's meddling in the 2016 presidential election. Four years later, Zuckerberg now says the 2020 election is, quote, not going to be business as usual. Next, 100,000. Jeep has unveiled its concept for a new three-row SUV, the Wagoneer. It's a revival of the famous Wagoneer station wagons and SUVs that the brand sold between 1963 and 1993. The new Wagoneer comes with a range of new tech savvy features. It has a hybrid electric option and the price tag on the fully loaded model will top $100,000 when it goes on sale next year. In the same announcement, Jeep also unveiled an upcoming hybrid electric version of its Wrangler SUV as part of the company's promise to add electrified versions of all of its models by 2022. And finally, 60. SpaceX just delivered 60 more satellites into orbit today. These join an interconnected network of other small satellites already in low Earth orbit. So why do all of these satellites matter? Well, Elon Musk ultimately wants his Starlink network to provide internet access from virtually anywhere to anyone on the planet. Elon's plan is to get 12,000 of these satellites into orbit. To date, SpaceX has launched about 650, but early tests are looking good. SpaceX says the Starlink network lets you play the fastest online video games and its download speeds are fast enough to stream multiple HD movies at once. That's it for After Hours, but before we go, here's one more thing to keep an eye on. It's Jobs Friday tomorrow. That's when the US government releases the latest numbers on the unemployment rate and how many jobs the labor market has either gained or lost. Economists expect tomorrow's report to show that the economic recovery from COVID-19 marches on, with 1.32 million jobs added to the economy in August. Get up to the minute developments on that story by going to CNBC.com and downloading the CNBC app. We'll be back here at our home office next week on Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. So be sure to catch us then.